Today on Supernova, we don't just look at stars, we listen to them. Plus, we do some observing during the day, and we spend some time with the Great Bear. Welcome to Supernova. I'm Eric Dunn. NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope for about one and a half billion dollars. When Canada launched its first space telescope for less than one percent of that amount, it immediately got the nickname the Humble Space Telescope. Dr. Jamie Matthews is Professor of Astrophysics at the University of British Columbia. He's also the mission scientist for the space telescope known as MOST. Canada's first space telescope is officially called MOST which stands for Microvariability and Oscillations of Stars. When MOST was first proposed, uh, what we wanted to do was seismology of stars. We can't put seismographs on the surface of a star, but we can, from the distance of the Earth, observe the changes in the brightness of the star as it vibrates, as these waves travel through the star and over its surface. And we can use those vibrations to basically probe inside the otherwise completely hidden interior of a star. And what we're trying to do is basically sample the fundamental characteristics of stars. Mass, age, size, luminosity, temperature, magnetic field. It's, it's like doing the demographics of stars. It's a census of the populace of the Milky Way. What I'm trying to do is literally listen to the sounds of stars. When a star is vibrating, it is creating waves, expanding and contracting. The gas is heating up and cooling down, and it's changing the light output of the star. And so the star is subtly changing its brightness with frequencies and amplitudes that are basically you know, the digital version uh, of the music that it's playing. And so we use the MOST Space Telescope to pick up those subtle light variations and translate them into the vibrations, into the symphony, which then tells us what the star is like inside and at what stage of its life has it reached. But those variations are extremely subtle. Go to New York City. Look at the Empire State Building at night. Imagine all the office lights are on, all of the office window shades are completely open. You could make the Empire State Building fainter by one part in a million, by one ten thousandth of a percent, by having one person stand at one window and pull down one shade by three centimeters. And that's the level of light variation that most was designed to detect and has in fact succeeded in detecting in stars. One of our, our first targets with most was Kappa 1 SETI. And I like to think of it as a pre-teen version of the sun. Kappa 1 SETI is rambunctious, a bit hyperactive, lots of energy, spins around fast. And it actually has a bad skin condition. It's covered with uh, big spots. And we've been able to use our observations of, of this star to tell us what a pre-teen sun was like. And it turns out that Kappa 1 SETI is what the sun was like when life was first springing up on the surface of this planet. And so it's important for us to know because we're trying to understand the interactions between the Earth and the sun. What were the conditions uh, when the oceans first came to be, when the first forms of life appeared on our planet. And again, we can't go back in time to the Earth or to the Sun to see that directly, but we can find analogs for that as if we were going back in time uh, to say, okay, here is the kind of behavior that the Sun was exhibiting and this is what the Earth would have experienced at that point in history. Ultimately, whether you're using the most space telescope or you know, a Celestron in your backyard, the, the real reason that uh, you want to know more about the stars is because it's going to teach us more about our star, the Sun. 
Most was intended to be a one-year mission to observe 10 stars. It's now approaching its sixth birthday with 2,000 stars under its belt. And they're hoping for the operation to continue for another five years. Anyone can view the night sky with their unaided eye, but it takes a hefty pocketbook to view the sun through a thing called a hydrogen alpha filter. For the past 20 years, Harry Klassen has spent a whopping $60,000 modifying his telescope in Langley. Today we visit with Harry, who shares his passion for solar observing. This is my telescope, and it is a CompuStar 14-inch Smit Cassegrain. A telescope should never be pointed at the sun unless you've got proper filtering on the telescope. The rays from the sun are very damaging to the eyes. Not even a split second and your eyes are finished if you have improper filtering. When we look at the sun, it is red, orangey red in color, okay? The filter that we have on the telescope is a hydrogen alpha filter and it's 0.5 angstroms. So we're, we're pushed way over. So it's eliminating 99.99% of the sun's light and allowing us to see into that band. What I like uh, best about uh, solar observing is that I can look at the surface of the sun, we can actually see the whole sun. We look at the modeling and the granulation on the surface. Then we look at the very thin line, which is the chromosphere around the outside edge. And then of course, when you see a prominence, what we call a prominence, going out, it'll either look like a tree, a shrub, or a straight line. There is another phenomenon, which we call plages, that we look at, and it's ionized hydrogen gas, which is trapped on the surface of the sun, and it looks as white as snow. At the present time, the sun is at a solar minimum. The less, when it's down the minimum, you won't even get any sunspots, like the sun is shown right now, virtually none. And when you're up at the maximum, there can be sunspots all over the place and very uh, active. When I have the telescope set up, I'm looking at the night sky for about three quarters of the night, then I take a break. Then I'm up almost all day looking at the sun whenever possible. But then you've got a hundred people as well that want to see the, the sun. I like uh, showing people the sun because I know that they've never seen it except in pictures and they seem to think that it is untrue. Some of the reactions that I get from people are, ooh, what is that? What's that red? <laughs> That is the sun. If you're interested in observing the sun, you don't need to spend as much as Harry. For under $100, you can view sunspots with a foil solar filter. Though you must take care to ensure that it fits properly and that there's no damage to the filter, not even pinholes. Remember to always use caution when viewing the sun, and if you're in doubt, consult a professional first. Don't take chances with your eyes. There are lucky people who can tell time without a watch. They observe the most recognizable sky pattern of all, the Big Dipper. Its seven stars float around the pole like the hand of a vast clock silently marking the hours. You might think the Big Dipper is a constellation, but it's not. It's an asterism, a pattern of stars that are part of the constellation Ursa Major. The Great Bear is imagined as striding through the sky with the Dipper handle as tail. The middle star of the trio that make the tail is double. A small light next to bright Mizar is easily seen. Elkor is sometimes called the rider, with Mizar as Elkor's bright horse. In the myth of the central plains of America, the bear is bull stars only, and the handle is warrior birds that chase the bear around the sky. In fall, the bear sinks low as though retreating into a den for winter. Next season, the celestial chase starts up all over again. Stellar astronomy is fundamental to our understanding of the universe. About 3,000 stars are visible to the unaided eye, or with the proper filters, we can look at the sun. So get out there and do some observing. 
Thanks for watching Supernova. I'm Eric Dunn wishing you clear skies.